In a Zoom meeting that transcends time and space, two of history's greatest minds log in from across the centuries. Al-Ghazali, the 11th century Islamic philosopher, theologian, and master of metaphysical critique, appears from the heart of Nishapur. Albert Einstein, the 20th century physicist who redefined time itself, joins in from Princeton. The topic? Nothing less than the structure of reality itself. Together, they engage in a deep philosophical debate centered around two timeless questions. What truly governs the universe? The laws of nature or the will of God? And can miracles exist in a world governed by scientific causality? Drawing from Al-Ghazali's Tahafut al falasifa and Einstein's reflections on relativity and quantum theory, their dialogue unveils a compelling intellectual clash between Islamic occasionalism and modern physics. From Ghazali's claim that fire burns cotton only by divine permission, to Einstein's conviction that God does not play dice, this is not just a debate. It's a convergence of two worldviews that shaped how we think about cause, order, and the mysterious architecture of existence. Peace be upon you, Albert Einstein. I've heard much about your profound mind and your pursuit of the secrets of the cosmos. But before we dive into equations and experiments, I must raise a fundamental question. What is it that truly connects events in this world? When fire touches cotton, and the cotton burns, do we really know that the fire caused the burning? Or are we merely observing a habitual sequence, a pattern set by the divine? In my view, there is no inherent power in fire, nor in any object. What we call causality is but a veil. Behind every flame, every flicker of motion, there is a will, God's will, continuously creating, sustaining, and choosing. If God so wills, the fire will not burn, and the cotton will remain untouched. This is not mere poetry. It is a reminder that we should not confuse habit with necessity. The world appears ordered, but that order itself is a sign, not a cause. And peace be upon you, Al-Ghazali. I find your approach intellectually rich, though I must admit it challenges much of what modern science depends upon. When I observe the natural world, I see patterns so consistent, so mathematically precise, that we can send rockets into orbit and predict eclipses to the second. Fire does not merely accompany burning. It produces heat, initiates combustion, alters molecules. These are processes we can measure and replicate. Now you may say this is just habit, but habit without necessity is chaos in disguise. How could we conduct science or even boil water if we assumed every effect might not follow its cause? And yet, even I must admit, quantum theory has unsettled these assumptions. The universe at its most fundamental level seems less like a machine and more like a mystery. But to abandon causality entirely, that's a price I'm not yet willing to pay. The laws of physics are not optional, even if they're not fully understood. You speak of predictability, dear Einstein, as if it guarantees truth. But let me remind you, even the most reliable patterns can be illusions. A child who sees the sun rise every day might think it rises because of the rooster's crow. Repetition does not confirm causation. Just because two events are paired does not mean one produces the other. In Tahafut al falasifa I challenge the philosophers who believed in inherent natures, claiming that fire necessarily causes burning. I asked, If God can create the world from nothing, can he not suspend what you call a natural law? The consistency you see is not due to fire's nature but God's will, his custom, not his constraint. If a miracle occurs, it is not a breach of law but a deviation from habit. Your science sees the burning cotton and records the pattern. I see the divine choosing moment by moment to allow that pattern. Or not. And if he ceases to allow it, what then of your so-called laws? That is a powerful parable, Ghazali. I too respect the humility it implies, but let's distinguish between illusion and discovery. Science is not superstition. It is the refinement of patterns through scrutiny. 
We test, we isolate variables, we make predictions, and when those predictions fail, we change our understanding. The sun does not rise because of a rooster, and science knows this, precisely because it asked. Now, regarding miracles, I do not deny the awe of unexpected events. But to call every deviation a divine act closes the door to further inquiry. Quantum mechanics, for example, does introduce uncertainty. But it does not suggest that anything at all can happen. It defines a framework of probabilities, not chaos, not pure will. The electron's position is unknown, but not arbitrary. There are rules. And these rules, strange as they are, still reflect a kind of order. If God exists, perhaps he speaks through those probabilities. But abandoning natural laws entirely, that, I fear, leads us away from learning and into submission to mystery for its own sake. You see rules, Einstein, and I see mercy. A mercy that chooses repetition for our benefit. Yes, patterns exist. But they do so not because objects demand them, but because the Creator grants them. You say science refines understanding, and I agree. But science, no matter how rigorous, cannot touch the essence of causality. It can describe sequences, but it cannot explain why they must happen, unless it invokes something beyond nature. Let us return to the cotton and the flame. Suppose one day it doesn't burn. Would your instruments call it an error? Or would you consider the possibility that the one who normally allows combustion simply chose otherwise? My point is not to reject your science, but to caution against assuming it has access to necessity. Miracles are not interruptions in reality. They are revelations of a deeper will at play. If all we trust is pattern, we blind ourselves to the sovereign freedom that underlies creation. And when we do that, we risk reducing a majestic universe to mere mechanics. Ghazali, your insistence on divine freedom is philosophically beautiful, but allow me to offer a different vision. If every event is at the mercy of an unseen will, how do we distinguish between order and chaos? Would the universe not be a place of terror if apples sometimes fell and sometimes floated? The human mind thrives on stability. We grow, we build, we thrive, because there is enough regularity to act with confidence. Now, you challenge science to explain the why behind patterns, and you are right, science is not theology. We do not explain existence through divine intent, but through models that work. Quantum mechanics does indeed challenge our classical ideas of causality, but even in its most mysterious corners, it speaks in probabilities, not caprice. The Copenhagen interpretation suggests that the world is not entirely determined, but it is not whimsical either. There is structure even in uncertainty. And if we are to make sense of miracles, perhaps we must ask, are they outside the system, or are they part of a larger logic we haven't yet grasped? You speak as if predictability is the measure of truth. But what if truth itself is larger than what prediction can contain? You fear a world where apples sometimes fall and sometimes float. Yet I ask, what makes the fall of an apple more rational than its flight, if both are subject to the Creator's will? Reason is not threatened by divine power, rather it is completed by it. You say uncertainty is tolerable only within a framework. I say the very existence of the framework depends on a continuous act of divine volition. Modern science observes, records, and hypothesizes. But it is blind to the source of being. You rightly admire the elegance of physical law, but do you not wonder at its origin? If laws emerged from chaos, then we should expect disorder. If laws are eternal, then what gave them such authority? I answer, the one whose will is not probabilistic, but sovereign. You see randomness and structure at war. I see them as two garments of the same tailor, who cuts patterns we glimpse, but do not comprehend. A poetic image, Ghazali, and one worthy of contemplation. 
but let us not mistake beauty for certainty. I am not afraid of divine sovereignty. I am cautious of its invocation in place of inquiry. Science, in its limited but ever-expanding way, seeks causes not to deny wonder, but to understand it. When Newton watched the apple fall, he didn't say God willed it and turn away. He asked how. Now, you question the origin of laws. That is fair. Physics does not explain why the laws exist. It only describes what they are and how they function. But perhaps that is enough for us to build, to heal, to reach for the stars. If we say God did it whenever mystery appears, we risk ceasing to ask questions. That to me is the greater tragedy. I do not reject faith, but I believe that faith, if it is to live alongside reason, must not dismiss the value of asking how again and again until the universe yields its secrets, or at least enough of them for us to keep exploring. Albert, you say that invoking God's will risks halting inquiry but I say it depends on how that will is invoked. To declare God did it as a way to avoid thinking is indeed lazy. But to acknowledge divine will as the ground of all being, that, my friend, is not the end of thought, but its beginning. I am not calling for the abandonment of science. I am calling for its humility. You believe that understanding emerges through relentless questioning. I agree. But questions must be oriented toward truth, and truth includes the metaphysical. Your instruments can measure motion, but can they measure meaning? You can speak of particles, but can you explain purpose? There is an arrogance in thinking that because we can calculate, we have understood. The Quran urges reflection on patterns, not to trap us in them, but to point beyond them. The flame that burns, and the cotton that turns to ash. Both are signs, not causes. We follow the traces, but we must not confuse the footprint for the traveler. There is wisdom in your call for humility, Ghazali, and I do not claim that science offers all answers. Indeed, the more we uncover, the more mystery deepens. But I am wary of cloaking ignorance in reverence. When we face a gap in knowledge, we must say, we don't know, yet not, it is unknowable. That is how humanity has advanced, not by assuming mystery, but by wrestling with it. And still, I share your reverence for the universe. I've often said that the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious, but mystery should not paralyze us, it should propel us. When quantum mechanics revealed its paradoxes, we did not retreat into metaphysics. We developed new mathematics. We refined our models, and yes, I admit those models still contain philosophical challenges, but they remain rooted in evidence. You speak of signs. I see signs, too, not of a divine author, perhaps, but of a universe intelligible to human reason. That, to me, is sacred enough to merit lifelong devotion. Albert, we have walked a long road together in this dialogue. Though our methods differ... I believe our aims are not so distant. You seek understanding in the fabric of the cosmos. I seek the will behind the weave. You search for laws. I submit to the lawgiver. But perhaps both of us are reaching for the same majesty, each with different instruments. Yours crafted from observation and number, mine from contemplation and submission. I do not reject the insights your science brings but I warn against the illusion that all can be known through experiment alone. Knowledge without meaning is a map without a compass. Let science pursue its questions, but let it remember its limits. And let us not fear the miraculous, for it reminds us that even the most stable pattern depends, ultimately, on a will greater than pattern itself. May your quest for knowledge remain noble, and may it never blind you to the divine silence behind every law. Ghazali, it has been a rare gift to speak with you. Though our vocabularies differ, I see the dignity in your thinking. You hold fast to the notion that behind every phenomenon lies a divine act. I, on the other hand, marvel at the possibility that from simplicity complexity arises, not from command, but from elegant principle. Still, your challenge lingers in my mind. 
Perhaps the line between habit and will, pattern and purpose, is not so sharp. Perhaps science and faith are two eyes, each unable to see the whole unless they look together. I may not embrace the supernatural, but I do embrace wonder. And if, in the end, we stand beneath the same stars in awe, then perhaps our differences are not barriers, but different paths toward the same mystery. Let us both continue our work, you in the realm of meaning, I in the realm of method. And may our efforts light the way for those who seek truth, in whatever form it may come. For Einstein and Al-Ghazali, the journey itself was a testament to the power of questioning, wonder, and mutual respect. Perhaps the true miracle lies not in defying nature's laws, but in two seekers from different worlds recognizing the same mystery and walking toward it together.